experience with ultra-heavy rigging challenges have long looked to Jake's International for expert, safe, innovative, and cost-effective solutions. Recognized as a foremost specialist in rigging design and fabrication, our reputation is sustained by state-of-the-art engineering technology and worldwide project experience, assuring our customers that their jobs will be safely completed on schedule and within budget. In November of 1988, Olson Beale engineers and constructors from Linden, Utah, contacted us about a job they were bidding in southeastern Utah. The job would be located 60 miles east of Salina, Utah, where Interstate 70 crosses Eagle Canyon and entail constructing a 500-foot span steel arch bridge for the westbound lane. The eastbound lane was constructed in 1962. Olson Beale asked Jakes to, one, make an erection study, two, devise a safe, economical, and feasible method to erect the bridge, a method that would offer complete adjustability during construction. Three, come up with a lump sum rigging quote and a bare rental cranage quote. Two major questions had to be answered. First, how to support 500 foot twin steel arches during construction. And second, how to set the ribs into place. The existing bridge had been constructed using temporary towers to support the arches and a cableway to place the ribs. Because of Olson Beale's requirements for economy and adjustability, we quickly eliminated traditional methods of arch support from consideration. Supporting the 16 rib sections per arch with shoring was out due to the 200 foot depth of the canyon. Rather than employing stationary towers as had been done in 1962, Jake's proposed using 40 foot wide by 120 foot high temporary luffing towers for added adjustability. The towers would be located just behind the abutment on each side of the canyon. The foundations for the towers would be incorporated into the spread footing of the abutment. The tower legs would pin to the foundations in order for the towers to be luffed forward or backward as required during construction. Each tower leg would be sleeved from the foundation up to the top of the abutment with a large diameter pipe so that the abutment area could be backfilled while leaving the tower still free for luffing. Back stay lines would run from the top back corners of the towers down to 50-ton barge winches anchored to the sandstone rock with Williams rock bolts. These lines would be multiparts of one and a half inch diameter wire rope. Each line would be tensioned with a system made up of eight parts of three-quarter inch diameter wire rope, two four-shiv 40-ton construction blocks, a 15,000-pound inline dynamometer, and a 50-ton BB barge winch, the same system we use to tension our American Guy Derricks. Four stay lines would run from the top front corners of each tower down to each rib. These would be multiparts of three-quarter or seven-eighths inch diameter wire rope depending on the rib location and consequent forces involved. Each line would be tensioned by using a system made up of an 8,000 pound grip hoist with multiparts of 5 8 inch diameter line and a 10,000 pound inline dynamometer. Having dynamometers and tensioning systems in all back stay and four stay lines would one, guarantee the design safety factor by letting us know what was going on inside the system and two, provide unlimited adjustment control. First, as each rib is set, a four-stay line would be connected to it and tensioned up until the crane could be cut loose. Next, the back-stay line on that corner of the tower would be tightened to bring the tower back to plumb to compensate for the added weight of the rib. And lastly, the four-stay line would be readjusted if the rib was not hanging at precisely the right angle. Further, both towers could be luffed back by tightening all four backstay lines at one time to provide the required clearance for setting the two closure ribs at mid-span, and then luffed forward again to lock them in place. We rejected using cableways to set the ribs due to cost. Instead, Jake's engineers proposed using an American 9310 Sky Horse to set the first four ribs in each arch on each side of the canyon. Then, by adding two single one and a half inch diameter guy wires, the Sky Horse would be converted into a guy horse for setting ribs five through eight in each arch, reaching out to mid-span. Each guy wire 
would be tensioned by Jake's standard guy line tensioning system. The Sky Horse would be positioned in the abutment area, far enough off the center line of the roadway, so the boom would clear the temporary tower when setting the ribs. In order to maintain a boom angle greater than 40 degrees, a 350-foot boom and a 180-foot mast was required. With this combination, the Guy Horse is capable of setting 54,000 pounds at a 280-foot radius. The ribs would weigh approximately 30,000 pounds each. Olson Beale used Jake's erection proposal in their bid package and became the successful bidder for bridge construction. Ralph L. Wadsworth Incorporated from Salt Lake City, Utah was the general contractor. Utah Department of Transportation was the owner. Field construction was scheduled to start on the 15th of June, 1989, with completion projected for the 10th of September, 1989. Per our bids, Jake's fixed price rigging contract was to one, provide all rigging engineering, two, provide all rigging gear, and three, provide technical field supervisory personnel. Our bare rental cranage contract was to provide an American 9310 guy horse. All rigging design conformed to OSHA, ASME B30, and AWS standards. After final design was completed, the forestay, backstay looked as shown here. Major engineering calculations were made. First, to determine the tensions in each backstay and forestay line to the design towers, figure wire diameter, numbers of parts of line, snatch block capacity, lug sizes, etc. Second, to determine the capacity of the sky horse as a guy horse and the horizontal thrust of the boom. And third, to determine the precise guy horse position for setting each rib. Two dead men would be used for setting all eight ribs on one side of the canyon. This meant that the center line of the guy horse would have to be positioned at a different specific point for each rib placed in order for the angles between the guy lines and the longitudinal center line of the lift to be kept equal. The construction sequence was first to erect all west ribs. First, ribs numbered one through four in both the north and the south arches would be placed with a sky horse. Then, ribs numbered five through eight in both arches would be placed with a guy horse. Second, after placing all 16 west ribs, the crane would be moved to the east side where it would erect all the east ribs in the same sequence. Third, all the columns and girders on the east side would be set. Finally, the crane would be moved back to the west side to finish the bridge structure from there. The way that it actually looked during construction is shown here. Olson Beale started erecting the west ribs as planned. First, they laid a safety net across the canyon floor under the construction area. As each pair of ribs was set, the safety net was pulled up and connected to them. Outrigger beams extended the fall range of the net 10 feet outside the arches. One of Jake's rigging superintendents spent a full week with Olson Beale's crew and crane operator, familiarizing them with the operation of the American 9310 Sky Horse and the Luffing Towers. When they finished setting west rib pairs numbered one through four and were getting ready to use the Guy Horse, one of Jake's rigging engineers went to the site and rehearsed the guy horse procedure with the whole crew. He also helped them with the first guy horse lift. After the west ribs were erected, the crane was disassembled and moved to the east side of the canyon and reassembled. On each side of the canyon, they constructed lift pads of crushed limestone compacted over a sandstone formation. Crane mats were embedded flush with the top of the crushed limestone so that the Sky Horse tracks walked on the mats and the trailing counterweight rolled on the crushed limestone. When the crane was configured as a guy horse, the tracks were oriented perpendicular to the longitudinal center line of the lift and all setting was done over the side. This was so it could be walked back or forward as required to keep the horizontal angles equal between the center line of the lift and the guy wires to prevent side loading of the mast. The east temporary tower was uprighted and initially supported by two pipe braces. 
The tower legs were made of W24 by 117 wide flange beams. The top beam was a W24 by 76. The bottom eight feet of the legs were sleeved with a 36 inch diameter standard wall pipe to keep them free of backfill material for ease of movement. The backstay lines were hooked to the top of the tower and to the anchors and winches. Each backstay line and winch was anchored to eight one inch diameter by 30 foot long Williams rock bolts by an I-beam structure. Each guy horse winch and I-beam structure was anchored to the sandstone using four one inch diameter rock bolts. In each case, the bolts and structure were oriented and inclined at the same angle as their respective backstay line. Each rock bolt was pull tested to 80,000 pounds. The maximum expected tension was 68,000 pounds per part of one and a half inch diameter wire rope as compared to the safe working load of 76,000 pounds. Each four part backstay line consisted of two 75 ton double equalizing shivs at the top of the tower and one 87 and a half ton snatch block at the I-beam structure. The backstay lines were tensioned with Jake's standard guy line tensioning system. The ribs were assembled on the roadway. They were two feet, nine inches wide, six feet high, 30 feet long, and weighed approximately 30,000 pounds each. Ribs numbered one through four in each arch were picked, swung about 180 degrees, and set directly into place with a sky horse. Note that number one ribs were freestanding when set, and the four-stay line started with the number two ribs. A tugger mounted at the base of the tower and a snatch block mounted on the high end of the rib being erected were used to pull out each four-stay line so it could be hooked to the rib tie-off lug. Once attached, the four-stay line was tensioned to a pre-calculated value using the grip hoist tensioning system at the top of the tower. The crane line was then cut loose and the back stay line on the rib side of the tower was tightened to re-plumb the tower. When the next rib was set, the tension in the previously set rib was adjusted as necessary. This unlimited adjustability in both the forestay and backstay lines made it possible to precisely control the vertical angle of the arches. For operating when the crane was configured as a guy horse, the number five through number eight ribs were stockpiled down on the keyway bench as room would allow to keep the guy line hookups to a minimum. The precise procedure used for placing each rib was demonstrated here in setting the last rib, number eight north. This rib was placed at a radius of 273 feet. First, hook up to the rib, hoist and swing until the boom points in the direction of the set point. Second, hook up the two rear guys but leave them slack. Third, boom the load out until the trailing counterweight tires raise off the ground about six to 12 inches. Fourth, Walk the crane until its center line is positioned over a predetermined point for setting this rib. Fifth, set the travel locks or block the tumblers. Sixth, place one half by six by six inch angles behind each track and bolt them down to the crane mats with one half inch by six inch lug bolts on one foot centers. The angles were necessary to increase the sliding resistance to a 2.5 to 1 safety factor. Seventh, tighten up on the guy line winches until the trailing water tank tires are just one inch off the ground. Dog off the winches, check the guy line dynamometers. The mass should be plumb sideways if both dynamometers read approximately the same. As a backup, Monitor the mast tip with a transit located on the longitudinal center line of the lift. Eighth, boom the rib out into place while monitoring the water tank tires. The tires should and will probably not raise more than 10 inches during booming. If they do, stop and tension up on the guy line winches to pull the tank back down until the tires clear the ground by one inch. To position the closure rib, both towers had to be luffed back until sufficient room was available to slide the rib sideways into place. This ability to luff the towers was a key part of our plan. 
After tightening all the connecting bolts and installing the X bracing, both towers were luffed forward until all the four stay lines were slack. The tower's back stay and four stay lines had served their purpose. With the arches in place, tower dismantling could begin. The east tower was dismantled first, and the east side of the bridge deck structure was completed by setting the columns, deck girders, and the transverse diaphragm beams. The crane was disassembled and moved back around to the west side of the canyon, where it was reassembled into a sky horse configuration. The west tower forestay and backstay lines were dismantled. The bridge structure was then completed by setting the remaining columns, deck girders, and the transverse diaphragm beams. It was the 31st of August. The job was completed ahead of schedule, under budget, and with no lost time accidents. With the bridge structure finished and ready for the concrete contractor to start the deck, Jake's team looked back on all that was accomplished. Rather than setting up cableways over the rugged 500-foot wide canyon, Jake's engineers chose to have the arch section swung into place. Rather than supporting the arches from stationary towers as they grew toward the center, luffing towers were employed. First, the closer sections were placed by an American 9310 crane configured as a sky horse. Then the crane was reconfigured as a guy horse to boom the 30,000 pound sections out as far as 273 feet. In placing the final sections in the arch, the towers were luffed back to open the center gap wider. With the center sections in place, the towers were luffed forward to relax all the forestays and the arch joints closed tight, making a perfect fit. One secret to making this method practical was Jake's ability to separately retension every individual fore and back stay line, adjusting tensions according to a pre-engineered plan. All calculations proved accurate. The arches and superstructure were completed ahead of schedule. This phase of the project came in under budget, and best of all, there were no lost time accidents. Jake's International, putting safety first while innovating for results.